Session 10, The Contradictions of Atheism, our hymn, Praise to the Lord. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O God, grant us a spirit of wisdom and insight to know you clearly. Enlighten our innermost vision that we may know the great hope to which you have called us, the wealth of your glorious heritage to be distributed among the members of the Church, and the immeasurable scope of your power in us who believe. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, for ever and ever. Amen. A reading from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against the irreligious and perverse spirit of men who, in this perversity of theirs, hinder the truth. In fact, whatever can be known about God is clear to them. He himself made it so. Since the creation of the world, invisible realities, God's eternal power and divinity, have become visible, recognized through the things he has made. Therefore these men are inexcusable. They certainly had knowledge of God, yet they did not glorify him as God or give him thanks. They stultified themselves through speculating to no purpose, and their senseless hearts were darkened. They claimed to be wise, but turned into fools instead. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What a condemnation of the stupidity of atheism, and in fact of all sin, is... St. Paul's letter to the Romans. 
atheism just does not hold up. An atheist is one who believes that God does not exist. He explicitly rejects the intimate and vital bond between God and humans. Some atheists are materialists, restricting their needs and aspirations to this world. Others are humanists, looking only for social and economic, economic liberation. Atheism is often based on a false idea of human autonomy, exaggerated to the point of refusing any dependence on God. An agnostic does not necessarily deny God's existence, but he does not perceive God's intimate and vital bond with humans. Ever since people have been able to think, they've given two different accounts of what the universe really is and how it came to be. First, the religious account. A theist comes from the Greek word for God, theo. Theos, right. A theist believes that there is something behind or beyond or outside the universe, which made the universe. It is more like a mind than anything else. That is, it is conscious and it has purposes and preferences. In fact, it is more like someone than something. We call it God. Second, the atheist account. An atheist believes that there is no God. An atheist is perforce a materialist, or more precisely, a naturalist. He believes that the ultimate fact, the thing you cannot go behind or beyond or outside, is the universe, a vast process in space and time which is going on, and always has gone on, he thinks, of its own accord, with nothing outside it. I think an important word, one of the most important words there is, an atheist is one who believes. Yes. It is, it is a belief. Yeah, very much. Both of these are beliefs. Mm -hmm. Both of these explanations, right? If a naturalist has to account for a thing or an event in the universe, he does so by referring to other things and events in the universe, not to anything outside. Everything, he thinks, can be observed, studied, and in principle perfectly understood by the methods of science. For all things and events in the universe fall into patterns that give rise to what we call cause and effect. If you want to read more about that, uh, more carefully put perhaps, you can read footnote 6. How do we decide which account is true, the theists or the atheists? We cannot decide by scientific methods, for modern science is concerned only with things in the universe that can be observed by means of the five senses, and with ideas that can be deduced from observations and checked against other observations. If there is anything behind the universe, science cannot reveal it. We will have to remain ignorant of it or discover it in some other way. That is not to put down science. I'm a teacher of physics myself, and I love the science very much. But it has its limits. We all love observation. Now, many people think that the religious and the atheist accounts of the universe are equally valid. They think that God is an optional extra. You can believe in him if you like, they say, but we can settle the practical problems of everyday life without him. Even religious people have become imbued with this idea. That is why some Catholic politicians promise not to let their religion influence their vote. Now, I'm not going to read footnote 10, but you might like to. I'm not talking here about the separation of church and state. You can, that, that is one of the founding principles of the American um, Constitution. But you can read how it's different from this. 
different from the idea that, you know, you shouldn't let religion influence your vote. That, along the same lines, that's why some parents leave it to their children to find out about God on their own and believe in him if they want to. That's not uncommon. Do you remember that man who became a Catholic when we were teaching RCIA? And he had two very small children. And you asked if they were going to be baptized at the same time. And he said, oh, no, no, I'm not going to force it on them. So we both looked at him and said, do you believe it? He said, yeah. You believe it's true? Yeah. Then why would you keep it from your children? Oh, I hadn't thought about that. I think it made him, do you remember? I just think he hadn't thought about it. Right. And the world's view is very much leave it up to somebody else. Yep. But we don't leave anything else up to everybody else. No, we teach our children all the other things they need to know. A traffic light is red. <laughs> don't go. <Yeah. laughs> now, in this talk, we want to show that the atheist point of view of the universe, the atheist view of the universe, I should say, is not viable, for it cannot even in principle account for two phenomena we are all familiar with. One is our sense of right and wrong, and another is our ability to reach truth by reasoning. You might like to read, there are others, but those are the two that we find most easy to, to talk about, and they're not easy. This is not like last week's talk where you were coloring. <laughs> this is much more complicated. But I think most I people I don't know can, about more complicated. <laughs> I think more, most people can follow it. But you might like to read footnote 11. Atheism's inability to account for the second, that is, our ability to reach truth by reasoning, that especially makes it intellectually self-destructive and puts it right out of the question for thinking people. So let's take the first one first. Right and wrong. When the Russians invaded Ukraine in 2022, everyone said that what they were doing was wrong, from the heads of countries at the United Nations to people on the street all over the world. The same thing happened in 1939, when the Germans marched into what was then Czechoslovakia. Those who protested were not saying merely that they did not like the way Russia and Germany were behaving. They were appealing to a standard of behavior that they expected the Russians and the Germans to know and admit. Accordingly, both Putin in Russia and Hitler in Germany tried to justify their behavior to show that it was right by claiming that they were uniting the people who spoke their language. A similar thing happens in everyday life. When one person accuses another of jumping to the head of a line, the one who is accused hardly ever replies, why shouldn't I? Nearly always, he tries to establish that he had a good reason. He'd just stepped out of the line for a moment and was simply resuming his place, or that there is some special reason why he should go first. I remember a friend of mine who was elderly going into the bank and just walking ahead of the a line up of people just say, yeah, but I'm just, just, it won't take me long. But he, just, he always thought he had to justify it. Yes. Yeah. And nobody really felt that he was justified in what he was doing. I, I was embarrassed. I used to want to hide my collar. <laughs> Didn't want to, you know, I, thought, I was just, yeah. it, was, it was embarrassing. Well, I had a, an experience like that once of a student who, it was the last day on which students could get full marks for their lab reports. So they were all in after school trying to make the corrections they had to make and getting me to sign that it was acceptable. And one student came in and did just what you said, walked straight to the head of the line. And he said, just sign here. I said, no, the other, everybody else is waiting too. Get to the back of the line. Mine's very, very quick. I said, get to the back of the line. I'm not going to look at it till it's your turn. Well, he persisted to the point where I did something I've never, I had never done before and I've never done since. And that is, take, took his lab report and tore it in two and threw it on the floor. He said, now what am I supposed to do? I said, get some tape and tape the pages back together again. So he did. Took him quite a bit. Then he walked to the head of the line again. 
Now this time, the whole class, everybody waiting, just yelled at him. Yeah, it's, uh, anyway. <laughs> In general, except for that student, it looks as though both the accuser and the accused have in mind some law or rule or code of conduct about which they agree. That is why they quarrel. They each try to show that the other is in the wrong. And that would be impossible if they did not agree about what constitutes wrong. It would be like trying to establish whether or not a soccer player had committed a foul when there is no agreement about the rules of soccer. Goal. We have no goal posts, but I think that's where they would have been. <laughs> the law to which accuser and accused both appeal used to be called the law of nature or natural law because people thought that everybody knew it by nature without being taught. They knew that you might find the odd person who did not know it, like a person who is colorblind or tone deaf. Or mentally sick. Or that student of mine. Yeah. <laughs> But they thought that on the whole, the human idea of right and wrong was obvious to everyone. So to sum up so far, people in all times and places have appealed to a law of right and wrong that they think everybody knows, even if they do not, in fact, obey it. And don't we feel embarrassed if we have disobeyed it? They know the law of nature, they break it says C.S. Lewis. These two facts are the foundation of all clear thinking about ourselves and the universe we live in. We know the law of nature, but we break it. Now, people have tried to explain our sense of right and wrong in various ways. Some people think that it is just an instinct, like mother love, or the sexual instinct, or the fighting instinct or the instinct for food, or the instinct for self-preservation. Now, when we are prompted by instinct, we feel a strong urge or desire to act in a certain way. For example, if we hear a cry for help from a drowning man, we probably feel two instinctive urges. First, to give help. Second, to stay out of danger. Either might be stronger. But quite apart from these, we are conscious of a third thing, which tells us to follow the instinct to give help and suppress the instinct to run away, even if the urge to stay out of danger is stronger. That third thing is our sense of right and wrong. Our sense of right and wrong is different from an instinct in two ways. First, instincts point to what we want to do while our sense of right and wrong points to what we ought to do. Our sense of right and wrong judges between instincts and tells us which instinct to encourage. Second, instincts always urge the same kind of behavior, while our sense of right and wrong does not. For example, the instinct of self-preservation always urges us to save our lives. The sexual instinct always urges us to gratify our sexual desires. But our sense of right and wrong tells a civilian to suppress his fighting instinct and a soldier to follow it. It tells a man to gratify his sexual instinct with respect to his wife, but deny it with respect to other women. In some circumstances, a sense of right and wrong tells a mother to encourage her instinct to defend her child. In others, it tells her to suppress that instinct and report her child to the police. No, our sense of right and wrong cannot be just an instinct. Some people think that the law of right and wrong is just an arbitrary human convention, an artificial agreement, which could equally well be quite different. And I'm looking at footnote 13. Accordingly, they don't say right and wrong. They say appropriate and inappropriate. They think that the law of right and wrong could be equally well quite different. That, they claim, is why we have to be taught it. 
Now, some of the things we have to be taught are like this. For example, we all have to be taught to keep to the right on the road, but it could equally well be the left, as it is in England. However, not everything we have to be taught is like that. We all have to be taught the multiplication table, but it's not something we've made up for ourselves, and we could not equally well say that 2 times 3 is 5. We all have to be taught to brush our teeth, but it's not something that could just as well be left out of our education. It could, of course, but our teeth would decay. There are three reasons why right and wrong cannot be arbitrary human conventions. First, arbitrary conventions vary, like the conventions that surround the wearing of hats in school. I remember when we first started getting a lot of immigrants in North Vancouver, where I taught, um, and some teachers, these boys even wear their hats in class. Don't they realize that that's not appropriate? Well, this is quite arbitrary. In some, I mean, I know that the Jews, Jewish men, always wear their hats. I know that from Fiddler on the Roof. And some wear turbans. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas in England, I don't know why, um, men always remove their hats out of respect. Women put them on. And in our own Catholic faith, our bishop wears a mitre. Yes. We don't say, get yeah. out of here. You, yet I've heard people saying, you know, those, those kids wore their hats in church. I know. As though they should have known. Yeah. Arbitrary conventions vary, like the conventions that surround the wearing of hats in school or in church. However, as a matter of observable fact, the law of right and wrong has been very much the same in all times and places. The moral teachings of the ancient Egyptians, Babylonians, Hindus, Chinese, Greeks, and Romans are strikingly similar. And you might like to see Appendix 1 put together by C.S. Lewis. He went into all these um, laws of right and wrong in various societies and put them all together. It's quite striking. Universal, really. Um, Almost. Well, you can't prove it's universal without going through every single one. But he well, as he did, yes. I mean, it, more well, or less. Yeah, yes. that's what I mean. Yeah, but he's certainly shown that they are strikingly similar. Yeah. People differ about whether you ought to consider everyone else before yourself, or just your own family, or just your fellow countrymen. Who is, who is my neighbor? But they've always agreed that you ought not to put yourself first. They differ about how many wives you may have, but they've always agreed that you should not simply take any woman you like. Well, that's the first thing. Arbitrary conventions vary much more than the law of right and wrong. Second, we cannot expel the law from our thought, no matter how hard we try. We can banish certain aspects of it. For example, many people in our society have banished, thou shalt not commit adultery. But there are always aspects that we retain and expect other people to retain. For example, I knew a very honest man who believed that we are all free to choose our own values, our own ideas of right and wrong. But there is one law he thought everyone should observe. Thou shalt respect everyone else's values. Which is impossible if you totally disagree on fundamentals. He obviously tried hard not to be negative or judgmental when he told me that his niece was married to another woman and that their two children were the result of artificial insemination with sperm from an unknown man. But he gave himself away by adding, at least they're not hurting anyone. Mm -hmm. It seems that there was another law he thought everyone should observe. Thou shalt not hurt anyone. Even people who maintain that all values are personal or relative usually have some things they think absolutely wrong, like the destruction of the World Trade Center or the sexual abuse of children. Or the abuse when um, the Hamas went into uh, and, and killed, what, 1,200, I think, 
in Israel yep. two years ago. Even when they argue that nothing is absolutely or objectively wrong, they ordinarily behave and talk as though some things are. In fact, those who hold that there are no absolute values insist that it is absolutely wrong to <laughs> impose one's values on others. I talked with a lady who had a, philo um, a philosophy club which met in the room next to mine where the nearest photocopier was located. So one day I had to do some photocopying at lunchtime, so she said, oh, come on in and use it. She had written on the board. Actually, the club wasn't meeting. She was in there. She had written on the board, you are free to say whatever you like according to your values, but do it with respect. <laughs> Which was her value. So I said to her, it looks as though there's one value you are imposing on everybody in your club. No, I'm not imposing anything. I said, what about that one? Do it with respect. She said, oh, Maury. Yeah. Third, the idea of inventing or choosing our own set of values, our own law of right and wrong, is self-contradictory. For when we've stepped outside all value systems in order to choose between them, what grounds can we have for thinking that one is better than another? Unless we speak from within a value system, we can only exalt the values we happen to like. Now, you might like to read, I'm not going to read it, but you might like to read footnote 16. Lewis goes into this in much more detail. People who say there is no absolute right and wrong usually talk and behave as though there is. Definitely a good idea to read for I would say they 16. always do in some things. Yeah. Right. Just going to make a note here to myself for next year. No, the law of right and wrong is not something we invented, and we cannot change it. We have to be taught it, but as Aristotle said, the aim of education in the moral values is to make us like and dislike what we already ought to like and dislike. Then, he said, when we are old enough to understand, we will easily assimilate the reasons for the moral law. Otherwise, we will not even be able to perceive them. Some people think that right and wrong are just more emphatic ways of saying likable and unlikable or acceptable and unacceptable. That may be true by coincidence, but not all the time. Suppose one man gets to the theatre first and takes the best seat, while another gets there after me and removes the coat I have put on the best seat to save it for myself. I dislike both actions, but I claim that the man who removed my coat did something wrong, while the other man did not. Or suppose one man accidentally trips me up, while a second tries to trip me up but fails. I dislike what the first man did much more. He succeeded in tripping me, but I blame him much less than the second man who deliberately tried. Or consider the status of a traitor. In a war, the officials of an enemy government may welcome his behavior, but they nevertheless despise him. They like what he's doing, but they disapprove. No, what we call right or wrong behavior in other people is not simply the behavior that we like or dislike. And it's pretty obvious that the right kind of behavior in ourselves is not simply what we like or what pays. Finally, some people say that nature has conditioned us to call it right to keep promises, help our neighbors, etc. Because this is the kind of behavior that will ultimately preserve the human race. As evidence, they point out that with this idea of right and wrong, the human race has in fact survived. But we cannot attribute our survival to our sense of right and wrong, for in general, we have not kept the law. 
And what we think we ought to do is irrelevant to our survival if we do not actually do it. Besides, this is just an aside, but does nature, in fact, want to preserve the human race? On the contrary, species seem to last for a while and then disappear like the dinosaurs and make way for others. Why should we prefer our own species to the one that will follow us if there is one? In any case, the law of right and wrong is not directed toward the preservation of the species. For example, it might command that an entire army submit to slaughter. And if the last woman left on earth after a nuclear war happened to be a nun, it would still dictate thou shalt keep thy vows. Our sense of right and wrong then is not just instinct, convention, what we like, or what will preserve the human race. And if we treat it as if it is, we run into an insurmountable intellectual difficulty. To see this, consider a very formal, very simple example of reasoning. All chairs have seats. This object is a chair. Therefore, this object has a seat. Philosophers call this chain of reasoning a syllogism. The first two statements are the premises, the last one is the conclusion. Without premises, no reasoning is possible. We have to assume something to be true or nothing else can ever be known. Certain axioms have to be accepted as given. And if you studied Euclidean geometry in school, you know that Euclid started his book of geometry with, I think it's five axioms things which are self-evident. Notice that in the syllogism above about the chair, this object is a chair, all chairs have seats, two facts, and so is the conclusion. Therefore, this object has a seat. Is that what I said? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a principle of logic that from factual premises, only factual conclusions can be drawn. It is logically impossible to draw a conclusion that commands something or describes what ought to happen. For example, consider the following. Dropping bombs kills people. Fact. This object is a bomb. Fact. Therefore, you ought not to drop this object. Not a fact. It's an invalid syllogism because while the premises are about what is, the conclusion is about what should be. Anyone who wants to draw this conclusion has to smuggle in the additional premise, you ought not to kill people, which is not about fact, but about ethics or morals or right and wrong. Atheists argue illogically in just this way when they claim that the law of right and wrong, which tells us what we ought to do, is derived from instinct, which tells us what we want to do, or convention, which tells us what everybody does do. For example, instinct supplies premises like, I want to stay alive. Convention supplies premises like, everybody tells lies. But for me to conclude that I ought to act so as to stay alive, or that I ought to tell a lie, I would need the additional ethical premise, I ought to do what I want, or I ought to do what everybody else does. And don't we dislike it when, as it were, everybody else <laughs> does something which is wrong, and we don't want to do? Which we think we ought not to do. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Without ethical premises, no ethical conclusions are possible. If you start ethically with a blank slate, you end ethically with a blank slate. Anything else is logically an impossibility. As in factual reasoning, there are certain ethical axioms that must be accepted as given. 
Atheists account for the moral axioms by saying that they develop naturally, like our instincts. Now, our instincts developed, scientists tell us, by a process of elimination. For example, any individual race, any individual race or species that did not possess the fighting instinct would never fight and would be wiped out by those who did possess it. Any that did not possess the sexual instinct would never reproduce and would soon vanish. But the moral axioms cannot have developed in this way. Only our actual behavior, like fighting and reproducing, can have influenced our survival. The moral law, which describes how we should have behaved, but often did not, cannot have had anything to do with it. Unlike atheists, who account for everything in the universe by referring only to other things and events in the universe, Catholics believe that there is someone outside the universe, God, who made all that is, visible and invisible. And Catholics say that the moral axioms are reflections of God's nature, divine nature, which God implanted in our minds from the very beginning because he planned to make us divine. However, when Adam and Eve fell, our wills became perverted and our reason obscured or shadowed. In our fallen state, we needed to be reminded of the law and have it fully explained to us. Accordingly, God gave us reminders of the moral axioms. We call them the Ten Commandments. God wrote on the tables of the law, or some translations have tablets of the law, what men did not read in their hearts, St. Augustine said. Now, probably, if you want to follow all that, you have to read it again, and again. at your own pace and think about each statement. But um, it, I think it's a compelling argument for the idea that there is something outside the universe. Our sense of right and wrong is a... It betrays the fact that there is something outside the universe. So let's take a break. You might like to read it during the break. <laughs> Our sense of right and wrong, then, is compelling evidence that the atheistic, materialistic, naturalistic view of the universe is untrue. Now let's consider our ability to discover truth by reasoning. Again, intellectually this is difficult, and I would think anybody would have to read it more than once, but we'll try and make it as clear as we can. There are only two things in the universe which we can know directly. Our own sensations, like pain, hunger, heat, and cold, and our own emotions, like anger, joy, fear, and regret. Anything else we know, we know indirectly. For example, when I claim to know Father Vince, I mean that a certain idea or image of him is present in my mind, not he himself. What do you mean is I am myself, I'm not in your mind? Right. Okay. It is by means of that idea or image that I know him. Now, perhaps it makes a bit clearer if you look at um, footnote 33. In contrast, St. Paul suggests that in heaven we will have direct knowledge of God. For I shall know even as I am known. The church also recognizes infused knowledge directly conferred by God. But so, that's not the kind of knowledge I have of Father Vince. I like the way St. John puts it in his first letter, we shall know God, we shall see him as he is. Yeah. Yep. And footnote 34, essential to knowledge is that some reality from outside the mind is represented in the mind by what is called an intentional likeness, 
or similarity to the object known. Knowledge, therefore, is assimilation of mind with object. The better I know Father, the better the image in my mind of him corresponds to him. So there are only two kinds of things that we know directly, our own sensations and our own emotions. The ideas and images that we have of everything outside ourselves are inferred or deduced from our sensations and emotions by reasoning or rational thinking. It is by reason that we see or grasp or apprehend or comprehend, or know, or understand anything other than our own sensations and emotions. Things like, you are sitting there, or nine sevens are 63, or Mount Everest is higher than Grouse Mountain, or Queen Elizabeth II was crowned in 1953. I think we better update that. No, that's perfectly that, true. It is true, but I think we could still update it with King King Charles, Charles was crowned in... What year it was, I'd have to look it up. 2023? 2023, I think. The classic example of reasoning is the syllogism. But reasoning is hardly ever that formal or conscious. St. Thomas Aquinas said that to reason is simply to advance from one thing that is understood to another. St. John Henry Newman said that reason is the faculty of gaining knowledge without direct perception, or of ascertaining one thing by means of another. If this is true, and this is true, then this is true. Well, that's a, that's a, classic, that's a classic syllogism. Mm -hmm. But as we're going to say, um, we don't often, we hardly ever reason that formally yeah. or consciously. In ordinary everyday reasoning, we pass from one point to another in various ways by a mere indication, by what seems probable, or by an association in our minds. Then perhaps we fall back on experience, or the testimony of someone we trust, or a popular impression, or some inward instinct, or some obscure memory. I'm just going to look at footnote 39. It's worth looking at the reasoning that goes on in the movie, 12 Angry Men. The progress of reason is not unlike that of a climber on a steep cliff, who by quick eye, prompt hand, and firm foot, ascends in a way he does not know himself, by personal endowments and practice rather than by rule, leaving no track behind him. Students of mathematics, which I teach, often say that they know the answer but cannot tell how they got it. Very common, that. How we reason is a mystery. Think about the last time you jumped to the conclusion, by reasoning, without consciousness, without consciously doing so. Suppose, think about the last time you jumped to the conclusion that someone was dishonest, or pleased, or unhappy. Think of the many subtle symptoms in his manner, tone of voice, words, appearance, or silence. Or oh, just even a slight frown indicating I don't understand. Think about all of those things which your mind felt and analyzed almost unconsciously. Think of how much you deduced and how quickly. Then think of how difficult it would be to justify your conclusion, or even to explain how you got to it. We all reason like this, and it is reasoning, all the time. Whether we are geniuses, mentally handicapped, whether we can analyze what we are doing or not, we all have this living, spontaneous energy within us. That comes from St. John Henry Newman. And it's so true. And you said something I love to quote, all men have a reason, but not all men can give a reason. I was up in an area of the British properties a few days ago, and I saw a bus stop, a bus stop. Oh. And immediately I thought, oh, I didn't know buses came up this way. 
Just because I see a bus stop doesn't mean that there's necessarily buses there, but obviously there are. And if anybody were to say to me, well, how do you know? I'd say, well, <laughs> in that case, I'd probably be able to say, well, I've seen a bus stop. In that case, yeah. but a lot of the time, it's much less than that. Right. And just as true, nevertheless. So I'm not talking about formal or conscious reasoning, but nevertheless, reasoning always going on. To sum up then, my idea of anything outside myself is inferred or deduced by reasoning from the sensations and emotions it causes in me. Now, my idea of anything outside myself is true insofar as it corresponds to the thing itself. My idea of Father Vince is true insofar as it corresponds to him. Insofar as it's merely caused, rather than being inferred by reasoning, we do not call it true. Now that sounds complicated, but it's a principle we all use all the time. For example, in a story by Agatha Christie, Mrs. McGillicuddy wakes from a nap on a long train journey, sees a woman being strangled in a train that is passing on a parallel track, and summons the conductor. The man looks at her doubtfully. Then he catches a glimpse of a picture in her magazine showing a girl being strangled, and he says, now don't you think, madam, that you've been reading an exciting story and that you just dropped off and awakening a little confused? Why does the conductor think that Mrs. McGillicuddy's story is not true? And the answer is because he thinks that it is fully accounted for, caused in fact, by her reading material and her nap. For another example, take the suggestion that the idea of God in the human mind can be fully accounted for, but it's actually caused by a gene that some of us inherit while others do not. If that were the case, then we would rightly discount the idea of God as having no truth in it. As an analogy, imagine hearing a ringing in your ears. If it can be fully accounted for by the loud dance music the night before, we say that you are not really hearing, that is, you are not hearing the outside world. Real hearing is what is left when you have discounted the effect of the loud dance music on the auditory nerves. Similarly, real thinking about the outside world is what is left when you have discounted the effect of the nap, or the reading material, or the gene. I've got a, a very good example of this of a man I met for the second time quite by chance, and we continued a conversation we'd begun the first time, in which he had ascertained that I was a Catholic and a believing Catholic. And on the second occasion, he said, have you been a Catholic all your life? And I said, yeah, I was baptized just three weeks after I was born, and I've been a Catholic ever since. Oh, that's why you believe it. You were brought up that way. Now, he thinks my upbringing caused my belief, and therefore my belief can be discounted. It's not real thinking at all. He knows the cause of it. So, lots of examples. If, I, if I'd had my wits about me, and I didn't, but I would, have, I would like to have said to him, do you brush your teeth? He was, yeah. Have you done it all your life? Yeah. Who taught you? My parents. Oh, that's why you brush your teeth. You don't brush your teeth because your parents taught you. You brush them because they need to be brushed. And that has to be decided. Is there anything other than the cause? Yes, in my case there is. I thought a lot about the Catholic faith. And we constantly, in a sense, question, but only so we get a deeper knowledge and yeah. deeper understanding. Yeah. So, insofar as we think we know why, how something is caused, we don't consider it to be true. However, we, in other words, we discount the effect. However, according to an atheist, you cannot discount the effect. 
for, he thinks, the nap, the reading material, or the gene, or my upbringing, actually causes my mental idea of anything outside myself. Remember that an atheist regards my ideas as simply things or events in the universe, related to all other things and events in the universe by what we call cause and effect. On these grounds, an atheist can say, you think God exists because you were brought up that way. Or you think adultery is wrong because you are a woman. Of course, he can equally well say, you think Shakespeare is a genius because you are English. Or you think that two plus two equals four because you are a mathematician. If, and this probably needs to be read again, at your own speed and perhaps questioned, well, then I would welcome questions on it. So to, to the conclusion, to sum up, if thought can be fully accounted for, if it's actually caused in this way, then all thought can be considered to be tainted at the source. All our reasoning is discredited. There is no real thinking. But, and here is where an atheist thought destroys itself. It is his own reasoning that has produced his naturalistic, materialistic view of the universe. In claiming that his view of the universe is true, he implies that his own reasoning has led him to the truth about the universe. But the truth he has reached discredits the reading that produced it. The reasoning. What did I say? The reading. The reasoning. Yes. If my reasoning is simply the way in which my conditioning makes me feel, then I cannot trust my mind when it tells me about the universe any more than a man can trust his ears the morning after the loud dance music. An atheist says, I will prove that what you call a proof is only the result of mental habits that result from heredity which results from biochemistry. But if my mental processes are determined completely by the motions of atoms in my brain, I have no reason to suppose that my beliefs are true. They may be sound chemically, but that does not make them sound logically. And hence, I have no reason for supposing my brain to be conceived composed of atoms. Now that, believe it or not, is a quotation from Haldane who was a self-confessed, a self-proclaimed atheist. So how he saw that truth, maybe he abandoned his atheism when he saw that truth. He says, if my mental processes are determined wholly by the motions of atoms in my brain, I have no reason to suppose that my beliefs are true. They may be sound chemically, but not logically. And therefore, I have no reason for supposing my brain to be composed of atoms. This thinking is self-destructive. If thought is just electric currents or chemical changes in the brain, we cannot call any thought true or false. For there is no sense in which these words can be used about electric currents or chemical changes. I'm just going to look at footnote 51, which is the way Lewis sums it up in one of the many places where he brings up this point. An atheist's account of what goes on in our minds leaves no room for the acts of knowing or insight on which the whole value of our thinking as a means to truth depends. Atheism says, in effect, I will prove that proofs are non-rational. Or more succinctly, I will prove that there are no proofs. Atheism cannot be truth for it soars off the branch it sits on, discredits the process by which it is arrived at. We must, on pain of idiocy, admit that in reasoning, the process by which we determine truth and falsehood, there is something from outside the universe. For a Catholic, reason, which is an attribute of God, is older than the universe. God made the universe. When he made humans, he made us in his image, giving us something of his own power to reason. 
when we reason, he frees us from non-rational cause and effect as far as is necessary for us to know truth. When we say that we know something about an object we are contemplating, we claim that we are perceiving the truth about it. If we are, then our thought must have broken free from the universal chain of cause and effect. The result, the idea in our mind, must be related to what we are contemplating, the outside thing, by reason, at least to some extent. It cannot be merely a particular effect of that total and largely mindless system of things and events that we call the universe. Not easy to follow, but I think the best the best example of it is that um, no, forget it. There's no point saying them again. You just have to read them again if it if it's still obscure. Our conclusion is that our sense of right and wrong and our ability to discover truth by reasoning are compelling evidence that the universe is not all there is. There is something or someone outside. Can we perform a scientific experiment to see whether humans can really tell right from wrong and truth from falsehood? No. For modern science depends on observation. To understand this, observe worms. You will soon see that they move away from the light. There used to be an experiment in grade eight when I was teaching grade eight science. You'd take a shoebox and cover the half of the top of it and then put some damp paper in and put some worms on it. And sure enough, they would all start to move to the dark side. And then just in case it was an accident, you'd change it and you could watch them all go back to the dark side again. <laughs> but do they do that because they consider this the right thing to do? Do worms have a sense of right and wrong? Is it because the light forces them to move away? Does the light account for their behavior completely? You cannot tell. You can only observe what worms actually do. Imagine them having a discussion. I think we should go into the dark. We don't want people looking at us. <laughs> Similarly, no observation of humans can discover whether we really have the abilities we claim to distinguish right from wrong and truth from falsehood. We all acknowledge, I think, that we should not tell lies. I suspect that most of us sometimes do. Similarly, no observation of humans can discover whether we really have the abilities we claim. Fortunately, there is one thing, only one, in the whole universe about which I know more than science can discover, and that is myself. I do not merely observe myself from the outside as I observe everything else. I am myself. I know myself directly from the inside. I have inside information about myself. I am in the know. And every human being can say the same. I know that I have two abilities which no one studying me from the outside could ever see. Two abilities which free me from, raise me above, the observable cause and effect universe. One, my ability to know the truth, that which is, and second, my ability to know the good, that which ought to be. Both, as we have seen, imply that the universe cannot be all there is. My position then is this, there is only one case in which I can even expect to know whether there is anything outside or behind or above the universe, namely the case of myself. And in that one case, I find that there is. Or put it another way, alternatively, if there is a controlling power outside the universe, I cannot expect it to show itself to me as one of the observable facts inside the universe. 
any more than I could expect the architect of a house to be a wall or a staircase in the house. The only way in which I can expect it to show itself is by direct communication inside myself. As a light showing me the truth, for example, or as an influence or command trying to get me to behave in a certain way. And that is just what I do think. Is there anything outside the universe? In the only case where I can expect to get an answer, the answer turns out to be yes. Now I'm just going to go back to footnote 57. I said I can't expect a controlling power outside the universe to show itself to me as one of the observable facts inside the universe any more than I could expect the architect of a house to be a wall or a staircase in the house. God did become part of his own creation in the incarnation, but it's not something we could have expected. Now, C.S. Lewis, I've just been rereading all the books I have by him, and again and again and again, he makes the point especially about reasoning. The Abolition of Man, Christian Reflections, which contains the essays, the essays on ethics, The Funeral of a Great Myth, and The Poison of Subjectivism. Another essay in God in the Dark called Bulbarism. He imagines a boy, he calls him Bulba, who is taught to debunk every argument by saying, oh, I know why you say that. And it comes down to the... Uh, Two plus two equals four. Oh, you say that because you're a mathematician. In Miracles, Mere Christianity, The Pilgrim's Regress, Surprised by Joy, that's his autobiography, and that argument is one of the things that made them first realize there was something outside the universe. And I think it's important to note that he abandoned atheism, realizing that it just didn't stand up, it didn't hold up. He was very honest in a lot of ways. Very honest striving. but very perceptive of his own reasoning. Yes. Yeah. In fact, after he returned to his Christianity, he said one of its effects was to stop me um, examining my own motives and my own reasoning and my own inside. He said, and the reader will probably think in high time too. Most people don't analyze their thinking the way he did in his, uh, way he shows he did in his autobiography. And then two essays or sermons by John Henry, St. John Henry Newman, Dispositions for Faith, Implicit and Explicit Reason. Father is, uh, Father is ministering to the hospital this week while priests are on retreat. So when a call comes through from the hospital, he has to take it right away. It could be an emergency. So the appendix, appendix one, from C.S. Lewis, shamelessly copied, the law of right and wrong. And he's divided the law into various categories and talked about how it's been stated in ancient civilizations. Then something which I think is important as continuing, I said there's only one object in the universe about which I know more than anybody could observe from the outside something I observe from the inside, and that is myself. So Lewis is, um, he called it meditation in a tool shed, also inside versus outside information. Worth reading, I think. And since Father appears to have been called to the hospital, let me read what he would normally read. Um, this week, will ask you to read, suggest that you read, the second book of Samuel, chapters 15 to 24. In this week's Bible reading, David took a census of his people. He found 1.3 million men fit for military service. In itself, counting people is not wrong. However, David displeased God, for his census showed that he was relying on his warriors rather than on God. Next week, we will see that there is indeed a place for science in the Catholic faith. 
Science is good. Part of it is counting people. It's part of the dominion over the earth that God gave Adam and Eve. However, we must never forget that it is God who not only creates all things, but also and at every moment upholds and sustains them in being, enables them to act, and brings them to their final end. In all other words, what we call God's providence, who not only creates all things, but provides for them at every moment. It is he whom we must thank for everything, as David says in his final song of thanksgiving. So in the absence of Father, may Almighty God bless us during the coming week.